Hello ladies and gentlemen, how's it going? Screezilla here and I hope you're all well. And today you join me for a interesting ship. A ship that's extremely interesting. And a ship that is in World of Warships. Uh, it's a premium tier 2 battleship. Um, or rank 2, whatever you want to go with it. And as you may know if you play World of Warships, there aren't many rank 2 battleships. Well, that's because this is a pre-Dreadnought class ship. So, let's get started. This is the history of the Japanese Navy's Mikasa, the Empire of Japan's battleship. And technically, this is the last, well, th this is the last battleship for Britain that exists in the world, but it's also the last existing example of a pre-Dreadnought class battleship. Now, where to start with this pre-Dreadnought battleship? Being the last pre-Dreadnought in existence, or the only British, British built battleship still above sea, or on top of that, a scrap heap. Um, serving as the flagship for Toro Hirahachi, and I do apologise for any pronunciation of Japanese in this video, uh, in the Russo Japanese War of 1904 to 1905. So let me start with the last Brit British battleship statement, as I can hear people typing already. Experience from the Shino-Japanese War of 1894 showed the Admiralty that they needed to have a more modernised fleet. There was only one issue. Japan lacked the facilities and heavy machinery to build their own battleships. Luckily, China had just paid £30 million for their war losses. So Japan had a bit of money in their pockets to burn. So Japan ordered their first few ships from Britain and the United Kingdom. Mikasa, named from the mountain in the Nara region of Japan, uh, was the last ordered and one of the most advanced ships of the day. Now, I have to put this and state this, this is one of the most advanced battleships ever built. Pre-Dreadnought battleships, that is. Now, the Mikasa was based on a formidable class battleship and Although it was its own class technically, due to some minor changes in the original design, built by the Vickers Company in Borough, uh, the main change over the other ships in the form formidable class was an extra foot in length and beam, and two more 6-inch 152mm guns. So although, although paid for and built for the Japanese, the Mikasa is the only remaining British battleship, well, technically. So it is a British battleship really, but it is a Japanese battleship as well. Um, the Japanese spent a lot of time over in uh, Borough while this was being built. Uh, they built it to standards, they, you know, they, they helped convert things and get things ready for the Japanese Navy. It is a Japanese battleship, but it's a British built battleship and that is a huge huge thing because there, there really isn't any left nowadays and it's such a shame and the last being broken up was the uh, renown i think it was uh, uh, i think now uh back in the 60s and it was broken up for something like fifteen thousand pounds or it cost like a couple of million pounds like 15 million pounds to build or something stupid like that and it, it, it's, yeah, it's craziness. Anyway, we, we won't get onto that because I will rant all day. The Mikasa was a very impressive ship for the early 1900s, with a maximum speed of 18 knots and a 900, sorry, 9,000 nautical mile range. Um, four more than the renowned class, uh, sorry, the formidable class battleships of the British uh, Navy. Um, the sister ships could only get around about um, about five nautical miles at most, uh, usually about four and a half nautical miles off, sorry, 4,000 4, nautical miles, there we go. Um, but the Mikasa could almost double that range. So it was very impressive because of a new boiler setup and new engine designs and technology was moving so fast back then anyway. The Mikasa also had a vast armament, four 450, four 305mm main guns in two turrets, 14 152mm guns, 20 76mm guns, six 47mm guns, six 40mm guns, and four 18-inch torpedo tubes, uh, which were submerged, uh, two on each side, just underneath the main gun turrets. The ship's guns were also very accurate, up to seven kilometers, uh, 
700, sorry, 7,000 meters um, using the Bar and Stroud Coincidence Range Finder and a times 24 magnification site. Now, the Coincidence Range Finder was a big thing, uh, and I'll talk a little bit more about that as we go on, but it was basically a much more accurate way of measuring distance. For protection, the ship had uh, the extremely advanced Krupp cemented steel with up to 356 millimeters in some in some places mainly around the conning tower just uh, where basically the extra station for driving the ship is if your main bridge gets blown up basically um, it's those little round towers you see on battleships now the steel had an elasticity to it meaning it, it was harder to penetrate and produced less spalling and fragmentation when hit and this was a big advantage over the Russian used steel of the time um, which was a just a straight sort of hard steel really and it didn't have that sort of um, it didn't have that layering to it, it didn't have that sort of elasticity to it so it, f it would shatter more, fragment more and you get more spalling death from it. Now her career now, this is going to be a long one today. Um, laid down in 1899, so this ship is an old old girl. Um, she was built in the 1800s, very late 1800s, but that also makes her one of the oldest sort of steel ships around. There are a few older, but not many. Um, the ship set sail for Japan on March the 13th, 1902. So, not a long build time, as you can see, only three years to get built, which is pretty bloody quick for a battleship, in all honesty. Uh, sailing for Yokohama. As tension built between Japan and Russia in 1904, it boiled over and the Russo-Japanese War had begun. In February of that year, the Russian Pacific Squadron and Japanese Navy met for the first time at the Battle of Port Arthur. Now, this first clash did not pan out as expected. Admiral Togo launched a surprise night attack with his destroyers which he had expected to basically throw the Russians' fleet into disarray and cause them much problems because of damage and ship sinking and basically them not being in position. However, the Japanese fleet were already spotted before, so the Russians were ready. So when the two fleets clashed in, in the early morning, uh, the Russians were ready to go. Despite the large number of ships and shells in the battle, only a small number of sailors were actually killed or wounded with 17 Russians and 60 Japanese killed or wounded. The Mikasa being hit by two 10-inch shells. Um, she suffered a fair bit of damage and mainly most of the casualties were on the Mikasa. Now on 10th of August at the Battle of the Yellow Sea, the Mikasa was lead ship of her column, chasing down the Russian fleet, who planned on moving to Vladivostok um, to strengthen to, sorry, to, to strengthen their fleet and also to spread the Japanese fleet quite thin. The battle lasted seven hours, with around 7,000 rounds being shot by either side. It was also the first real battle of the open sea with a battleship. Now, proper battleships, now early battleships. This is your sort of main battleships that we see here, the Mikasa, such and things like that. This being so, neither side really had a huge ex no, a huge advantage for experience. The Japanese ship had better range finders. This meant that Japan had an advantage at range. Mikasa took a beating, being hit by twenty, being hit twenty times, and the aft main turret getting knocked out quite early in the battle. However, the Russian fleet had to flee back to Port Arthur, which was a big victory for Japan. Now, as I said, the coincidence range finder made a huge difference. It allowed that the Japanese Navy to fire rounds at uh, several thousand feet, sorry, several thousand meters, whereas the Russian Navy could only really get accuracy within 4,000 meters. So you can see the big difference here, and this is going to be a big thing as we go on. Because the Japanese guns were so much more accurate at long range, now that's the main guns, it gave them a huge advantage, especially in the battleship, the battleship combat, which now was becoming a thing. Um, and of course, this was a, a, the first time this has ever happened, so nobody has experience, nobody knows what's actually going to happen. The idea of the battleships at this time, why they have so many secondaries and thirds-line guns and fourth-line guns, 
and so many different classes of guns and rounds and sizes and all this kind of stuff is because, well, they were designed to get up close and brawl. So right now we're going to come around on Nassau and prove the point. All of our secondaries and third raries, I guess you could call them, are going to start lighting this Nassau up. Of course, the big disadvantage we have is that Nassau is a Dreadnought-class battleship. We are a battleship battleship. So yeah, it's not going to be an easy fight. But you can see all the secondary guns just blazing to fire there, and this was the idea of these types of ships. Now, of course, what happened was because the battleships had such thick armour, the secondary rounds would really not do anything. Um, at long distance, you know, when you're fighting at five, six kilometres away, you sort of focus that sort of range, the secondary guns just bounce harmlessly off the armour because the armour's so thick on a battleship or a dreadnought, so you can say. Um, so they become almost useless, so you rely on your main guns. And you can see where I'm going here. Main guns become a big thing as we go further on. Now, 27th of May 1905, the Battle of Tushishima started. Now, Mikasa was, once more, the lead ship of the fleet into combat with a vast 89-ship fleet, although many were smaller than the Russians. The Russians had 38 ships, all of which, um, uh, sorry, 11 of which were battleships, uh, while Japan only had five battleships. 11 battleships v 5 battleships, you sort of think, well, that's going to be a pretty solid victory from Russia. Um, but, of course, these are old battleships. Now, the Russian battleships were not very well looked after. Um, they were a bit rough. The Mikasa and her fleet were being commanded by Admiral Togo, which was a huge advantage because he had experience and was the only... Um, it was the main ace up their sleeve. He was the only commander with experience in fighting the modern ships. Um, a couple of Russian commanders, of course, were fighting against the Japanese. However, they all died. Uh, one of the Russian admirals got demoted for the loss at Port Arthur, uh, a little bit sort of prior to this battle where the Japanese fleet started shelling the uh, encamped Russian fleet and a vast number of their ships were destroyed. Uh, so he was demoted. And New Admiral took over, who had no experience fighting battleship on battleship action, no experience of how these modern ships worked. So it really made a big advantage having Admiral Togo on board. This mixed with the older ships of the Russian led uh, the Russian fleet led to a crushing defeat to to their fleet. All of their battleships were lost, mainly due to the fact that Japanese ships could use their main guns at longer distance. This also led to uh, Captain uh, Pakenham of the Royal Navy, who was an official observer on board. Uh, I think he was actually on board the Mikasa, and observed the battle, of course. Uh, his report was, in effect, the effect of the fire of every gun is so much less than that of the next larger size. When the 12-inch gun opened fire, the 10-inch passed unnoticed. Everything this war has tended to emphasise the importance to, the, to a ship to carry the furthest and heaviest guns that can be got into her at the time. This, of course, led to the Dreadnoughts. And yes, that's a big step up. Once HMS Dreadnought had been built, um, and HMS Dreadnought was built, I think, in oh, 1906, I think, off the top of my head. I might be off about a couple of years, so I do apologise. Uh, sorry, 1908, 1908, I think it was, sorry. Um, it was a couple of years, basically, after this battle. Um, she was actually laid down a little bit earlier. They were starting development on her, but it basically meant the unification of guns because as you can see there are lots of different guns on board this battleship you've got the big guns the smaller guns which are still big you know 152 millimeter guns are not small uh the smaller guns and then you go down to 47 millimeters and then for 40 millimeters and then you just keep going down and down and you just got more and more guns on board but these are effectively just making the boat heavier and adding more ammunition which causes more problems because ammunition can go boom and the Dreadnought was really the first ship to unify this, and it had, you know, its main guns, it did have a secondary, and then it had, you know, some small arms on board to take out smaller boats, things like that. But there weren't as many guns on board, and you'll notice with these early 
pre-dreadnought battleships, they've got millions of different caliber guns on board. Some of them even have, you know, the main guns, you know, which were 305 millimeters, and then they have a 280 millimeter gun on the back, and you know, just crazy stuff like this. If you look at some of the French battleships of the late 1800s, they've just got a mix match of all different guns on board, and it means you have to carry all different ammunition. Of course, you have to carry less ammunition because, of course, you need to service all the guns. So, Dreadnought was a huge, huge game changer, and the Mikasa is partially the reason why the Dreadnought exists, because of what the British learnt from the Japanese sailing this boat. Similar to, to the Second World War with the Spanish Civil War of what the Germans learnt, they learnt how to basically make a better battleship, and that's what a Dreadnought class was, was the better battleship. So back to the Mikasa. Um, Mikasa took over 30 large calibre hits during the battle, uh, but few penetrated. 100 of the 875 crew were casualties, however. Um, there aren't really no numbers of how many were actually killed in action, uh, but we do know about 100 were casualties on board. After the war, six days to be precise, a fire, fire in a magazine rack happened and exploded on board the Mikasa. As she was in port, 251 crew members were killed and the ship did sink. Now, the number of crew members killed in this explosion are more than were lost in battle. And just to give you an idea of, you know, the, the, back at the Battle of um, the, the First Battle, sorry, the, uh, the Battle of Tsushima, 7,000 rounds were fired, more, more than that, over 7,000 rounds were fired each side. There was about a 1% hit ratio of those rounds. But when you're having 350 millimeter rounds shot into your boat, they can generally cause damage, but the Mikasa had such heavy armor and was well plated that most of the rounds just simply bounced off and didn't really do much to her. Um, the actual exhibit in Japan, of course the, the ship does still exist, um, the ship in Japan, you can actually see some holes where they've been patched over, some impact places on the ship, it's amazing, it's very cool stuff. Now. When the explosion happened, it was a very unfortunate thing. The ship, however, was refloated nearly nine months later and uh, basically repaired all the way through. Almost three years later, the Mikasa was back in service, now as a coastal defence ship. And these were basically... Coastal defence battleships were sort of the battleships that aren't really worth putting into the frontline action. Now, during the previous Battle of Tsushima, uh, three of the... I think it was three of the battleships from Russia were actually coastal defence battleships, so they really didn't stand much chance because they were very old and very unreliable. Uh, but the the sort of a castle still had a use and still had a pretty decent purpose. It still had the armour, it still had protection. It was still a decent ship for the time. Um, so it did have some serviceability still, and it went on to serve up until World War One. It served up until 1921. Um, the ship was part of a intervention force in Siberia with the Russian Civil War as well. So the ship served past World War One and was part of the Russian Civil War, part of the Japanese intervention there to help the whites push back against the Reds, which didn't end up going too well if you know your history. And on the 23rd of September, the Mikasa was finally decommissioned. In 1923, following the Washington Treaty, uh, the Japanese government asked around that the ship could be preserved as a memorial ship, which everybody pretty much agreed to. They said, yeah, that's fine, uh, just make sure that it can't function anymore. So the Japanese pretty much gutted the engines and encased it in concrete so that the hull didn't need to be constantly upkept, because obviously keeping a ship in salt water is not a good idea. Salt water is not very good for boats, even though they sit in it all the time. I know it's a weird thing, isn't it? So. The ship was preserved as a memorial ship, which she is until this day, uh, encased in concrete in Yokohama, uh, Yokosuka, sorry, not Yokohama, Yokosuka. Um, so, the Mikasa, an absolutely fantastic ship, a very interesting ship, and just a really, really cool thing to look at, because it's the last example of a British battleship. It's the last example of a pre-Dreadnought battleship. It's an extremely important ship for the Japanese Navy. It, 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 it served as the inspiration for their future ship building and for their future naval conflicts and things like that. 
Uh, of course, you know, the Mikasa was pretty much out of date at that time because you had things like the Koachi being built uh, by the Japanese, the evolution of the Aki um, sort of hybrid of a dreadnought and a destroyer, and you had their first real, real dreadnoughts there. Now, interestingly enough, in the Second World War, of course, the uh, the preservation of the ship was not looked after too well, unfortunately, and the US forces and allied forces that were there keeping an eye on Japan, making sure they didn't do anything naughty, didn't really give a toss about the ship, so she fell into a state of disrepair. It wasn't until a bit later that um, a, a Philadelphian businessman, uh, John Rubin, formerly of Borough of England, or Barrow of England, uh, of course where the ship was built, uh, wrote a letter to the Japanese Times about the state of the ship, and this basically was the catalyst of a restoration campaign, with the support of the Japanese public and the American Admiral Chester, Chester, Chester W. Nimitz. Uh, the restoration of the battleship finally finished in 1961 and she was reopened and is there till this day. And interestingly enough, the relationships between Nimitz and this battleship have continued for a while because USS Nimitz actually, uh, I was going to say flew, uh, sailed off to Japan and started repainting her at Yoko, Yokosuka. I think I meant to say Yokohama earlier, but Yokosuka. And have repainted the ship back in 2009. And I think that's just a really cool little thing, you know. Admiral Nimitz actually saved the ship and did a lot to help it get rebuilt, along with the Japanese public, of course. The Japanese public had a huge support of this ship because it was an icon. Uh, but the Nimitz, the ship that's named after the Admiral, uh, went and helped repair it, which was just very, very cool indeed. So, yeah, the Mikasa, it's a very interesting little ship. Now, one thing about this ship is obviously it is available in World Warships. It's a premium ship and it's a rank 2 battleship and there's not really anything else like it. If you're looking at for it for World of Warships as some sort of wonder weapon, as a ship that's going to absolutely win you every single game and be amazing, look elsewhere because this ship is really not very good. Of course, you're going to be fighting lots of dreadnoughts, which means you're going to be fighting ships that had much more advanced guns on board. And this is not a good thing at all, because you're fighting ships that have heavier armor, heavier guns, better range, better accuracy, more guns. In a ship that's, you know, 10 to 15 years older than theirs, you're still going to be quite effective. And of course, if you did get a penetration with those big AP shells at long distance or HE shells, you're going to do a huge amount of damage. But it, it's hard to get citadels at range with this thing, because, well... Citadels are generally very small on the earlier ships, especially the cruisers. And as you can see here, we are fighting the ever popular and ever destructive St. Louis. Um, and the St. Louis is just an absolutely devastating ship with its barrage of firepower and HE shells. Uh, withering, withering blows, basically. It will uh, cut uh, death by a thousand cuts, you know, it's one of those things. And you really can't do much against it unless you get some very lucky hits or if you get close. Of course, those secondaries are still good, but they only have a 3 kilometer range, which is kind of not very good in World of Warships. It's not very often you get that close. Um, but of course, if you do get close enough to get some hits, and you get some good hits, you're going to take it out. But, yeah, it's, it's not really worth getting unless you get it on a special deal or have it very, very cheap. Then, as a collector, I'd recommend it. It's a bit of fun. It's an interesting boat. And its history is extremely interesting too. And I hope you've enjoyed this little look at it. If you have, let me know in the comments below. Give a like and a subscribe. You know, always usual things that YouTubers say. And we will be doing some more Warship history soon. It's going to be a little bit tricky because Warship history tends to be quite long. And there's much to say about it. But I'm looking forward to the challenge. So, hope you've enjoyed this video. And until next time, sail safe, keep well and I'll see you again. Bye-bye.